Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk today about defer. Uh, and defer is my favorite feature in Go. I remember when I first saw this little keyword, um, uh, I was kind of uh, blown away by it, really, and by the power of it, and also by the simplicity of it. And I couldn't really believe that I'd got so far without having something like that in the language before. So um, in this, well, I'll tell you a bit about me. Um, that's a picture of me there, so that you don't remember what I look like now. Remember that, because now I look shipwrecked, but that's how I'm meant to look. Um, so I, uh, uh, working at Pace, and we'd, we'd, we'd building um, a, a minimalist project management tool completely in Go on the back end, and then we've got a Svelte front end. Um, and uh, we use Defer a lot. I'll show you the evidence of that. We, we also did on, on Go time, we did an episode on Defer. Uh, and I do recommend this because we, we talked to the, the person who did the recent optimizations of Defer, which I'm gonna also show off today. Um, and then please tweet me. I like answering Go questions on Twitter. Uh, so please, uh, and don't DM, ideally do it publicly and then other people can also uh, join in. Uh, so yes, I did a search. We've been building Pace for about six months and we've used Defer 418 times in that period. And that's an average of 69 Defers a month. So we definitely like our Defers at Pace. So I'm gonna tell you what defer is and how we can use it to make our code better. Uh, but we'll also look at some of the common gotchas and what's going on really under the hood, which helps us make decisions about where and when to use it. And then I'll show you some of the performance optimizations that have been going on over time. Um, and they, 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 they do this sort of in the background and we just get to benefit from these optimizations. So it's a really cool, uh, I think it's a great thing that we don't have to worry too much about that kind of thing. We can just be users of it. And I'm going to answer, should I be using defer? And, you know, it's obvious that I'm going to say yes, isn't it? There's, there's, no, there's no suspense built there. So what is defer then? Well, uh, deferred functions are invoked immediately before the surrounding function returns. Um, and they do that in the reverse order. So it's quite a simple idea. Essentially, you defer a function, and then when the function you deferred it in exits, that deferred function is going to be called. So code like this is quite obvious. If we call the goodbye method and then we call the hello uh, function, uh, then it's going to print goodbye and then hello, because that's, that's what we expect. That's the order we did it. If, however, we deferred that goodbye call, then it, the, the order will flip around. And that's because the goodbye call is being run when the main function exits, not, not before. So remember the thing about the reverse order, what would you expect this to then print? Um, you'd be forgiven for thinking this is gonna print one, two, three, um, but actually, yes, they, they run in the reverse order in which you call them. So that's called LIFO, which is you know last in, first out. Um, and, and it's really, that's it at its core. That's as simple, uh, as, as defer can be, but there's some interesting cases when we, when we start to dig in and have a look at how we can actually use defer. One of the best use cases is when you're closing files. So in this code, I'm uh, opening a file. And then if there's no error, I'm going to go and open a second file. And then I'm going to process this text from these two files and then close the files after. And if you think about it, that's, that's the order in which we want things to happen. Um, you know, it's completely reasonable to write code like that. But watch out, as these very long arrows will point to, uh, there are a couple of places where we could leak file handles or we could not close files. And it is important to close files because it's a resource that the system gives you. You, you need to respect that and be a good citizen on this computer and give back, you know, free up those resources. So in, in, the, in number one there, if that second file fails to open, we're just gonna return the error. Uh, what we've done then is left that first file open. And in the second case, if, if something goes wrong processing the text, we'll actually leave both of those files open when we return that error. 
So that's not really brilliant. One solution would be to close the file before we exit at each point. So we could, you know, in the, in the first case, we can make sure we close that first file. And then if process text fails, we're going to close both. But imagine if you've got seven or eight um, files or things that you're doing that need closing or need cleaning up, that's going to quickly get a little bit out of hand. And this really is the perfect use case for defer. So what we do instead is we open this file. And as long as it opens successfully, there's no error. We then immediately defer the close of that file. We do the same thing for the second file. And now at any point that this function exits, we know that those files are going to be closed. And so that's really the power and the sort of simplicity. Look how easier that is to read than where we have to go and close at every exit point. Michael McLaughlin from Uber um, points out that this actually can encourage us to ignore the errors that come back from, from these close calls. And that is true, particularly if you're writing a file, because when you close the write of a file, it actually will do some final work to close the file, which could fail. So it's important to check errors of, um, of when closing writers, for example. And there are other cases. This close method is actually an interface in the standard library called IO closer. And it returns an error, which I regret. I wish they, I wish it didn't return an error and you'd handle the errors in a, in a different way, which um, you can do. In, in fact, in the writing a file case, there's a sync method which will do the final bits and pieces and, and you can check the error of that. So I prefer that kind of thing. I wish that we could just always call close in this way. Another time uh, it's, it, it's very useful to use defer is when you're making an HTTP request. If you make an HTTP request, you get uh, the body of that and you are responsible for closing that body. It's quite easy to forget this. So it is something you have to remember um, and defer is the perfect way to do it. Because again, if we have other code going on and we could exit in different ways in different places, we want to make sure that we still clean up after ourselves and don't leak things. And if you think about it, most of the time the code works without error. So it's quite possible you would never in your test code or in your when you're testing it yourself, you'd never actually notice these files being leaked. So um, this is where defer really helps. We use defer when we're working with locks for the same reason. So here I've modeled um, what can only be described as a kitchen and this, this is a, we want this kitchen to be a thread safe kitchen so that it can receive many orders at the same time and we're not gonna have any uh, corruption with the internal state. So in order to achieve that, we really need to use mutex to protect that internal state here. So when we, when we call take order, we're gonna, we're gonna lock the mutex we then go and do all the bits and pieces and notice there are other errors that could happen down here. And then at the end, we're gonna unlock it. But the problem is, as these extremely long arrows point to, there are places where things could go wrong. Like if, if the order's not valid there in that first case, we're gonna return the error. We've locked the entire kitchen still. We didn't unlock it. Um, so that's like, you know, that's not a great kitchen, is it? That's a very temperamental kitchen if it's behaving like that, frankly. So the solution is to use defer to do the unlock. And notice how useful it is to have these two things right next to each other. You know, when you get used to that pattern, you'll easily see where you've missed a, to, you've missed an unlock call. Um, and it's nice that the the things dealing with locking and unlocking are in one place in the code. It just cuts down on the cognitive load needed to kind of debug this later. Jana Dogan makes a good point um, about that, which is if you if if you if your attention is easily grabbed elsewhere, it's very easy to forget these simple things. And so having a way in the language to address it up front is very powerful. So 
Defers work with conditions too, and this will give you a clue that there is some um, run something in the runtime going on in order to make defers work. So here I've added a, a secret option, so you can make a secret order. I don't know why that would be a thing, but in this kitchen it, it is. Um, and so what happens is only if it's secret will it will it lock the kitchen and increase the little counter here. And so the defer is happening inside that conditional block. And that means it won't be called if the code path didn't take that route. So then we know something's happening at runtime, isn't it? Um, and and we'll, we'll find out what that is. We can use defer to clean things up. And uh, doing this in test code is extremely useful in, in particular. So in this example, at number one, I've got this little cleanup function. And it's just a simple function there, really. It's there for documentation, really. Um, you, would, you, you could do this anonymously without creating a type. But what we do is we have this create test files function, which is going to return as the second argument, the cleanup function. And what we expect is we can put our, we can create this little cleanup function in inside the, the actual function that creates the test files. So in one place, we're creating the test files and then creating the function that's going to clean up those test files. We just return that. And when we when we come to use it, we get quite a nice little API where we ask for the test files, we get them, we immediately defer the cleanup, and we know that however this test exits, uh, we, we aren't going to be leaving files left around, even if tests fail, they'll be, they'll be called. So it's very powerful. And what, I mean, apart from maybe the weirdness of creating the little function inside another function, what a, what a lovely API you end up with. For your users. You can do this as well in real code, not just in test code. This actually is entirely the, um, the code needed to build a little timer. And how it works is, you know, again, we've got this stop function. You could just have the function, but it's nice to for documentation, I think. And then we we can we have this new timer function, which is going to return the stop function. And we're going to catch the real time in here and store that as start. And then we, we create a, an anonymous function here um, and assign it to the stop variable, which we return. And because of the closure environment, it, ha it has access to the start variable. So at three, it can do something like time since start. And this is just going to print out how long it took essentially between calling new timer and then calling the stop function. And so in some middleware for HTTP service, for example, you could use it like this. You get the stop, you start the timer, immediately defer the stop, and then you go about your business. And what will happen is it'll print the amount of time that that took. So that, that's a, you know relatively simple, nice little pattern you get to reuse. And of course, it doesn't just have to print things. That could be you know, sending it to some um, other system where you might be tracking these kinds of things, some monitoring system. You can, you can use this technique in, in a variety of ways. There is a thing I've seen which I really don't think we should do, and I call it squashing defers. So this number one is technically correct, but what's happening there? It looks almost like we're deferring the setup but we're not. What's happening is that setup function is called immediately. It's returning the teardown. And then that's the function we're deferring. But it's just too weird. And I, uh, you know, I understand we have this kind of temptation to, to really shrink code down. For some reason, it feels like we've optimized or something. But what we've done is just made it a bit more confusing than it needs to be. This other option, I think, is much simpler. Look, we'll store the teardown and just defer teardown. You're actually saying teardown as well. So it's more storytelling that you get to do for yourself in the future and for your teammates and um, open source colleagues. It's time for the defer fact of the day. Sorry, that sounded like Alan Partridge, didn't it? <laughs> Ken Thompson came up with the idea of defer um, and is probably influenced by the Plan 9 kernel error handling stack, which you can check out there. Um, 
thanks to Russ Cox for providing these. Some of these are, are unknown facts about the first. It's a very exciting time for everyone. Just gonna have a sip of this water, excuse me. So it so far looks like defer, it's just all roses. It's not all roses. There are some common gotchas. Uh, and have you seen this optical illusion before? This is amazing. The A and B squares, the background color on those squares are the same color. Uh, and, and this is a common gotcha. Something's going wrong in the software in our brain. It's trying to rationalize that shadow and it gets it wrong. I promise the A and B are the same color. I checked it with the digital color meter. They're all it's 5C, 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 both of them. Um, if you don't believe me, please check that for yourself. I think you should be critical, but imagine if that wasn't true, why would it even be in this presentation? Do you know what I mean? So think, okay? It's definitely true. Right, so let's have a look at a common gotcha then. Most of the common gotchas around defer relate to some flavor of this, this issue, which we'll talk about. What do we expect this code to print? Ah, you might say, well, we remember that they're going to be in, they're going to be called in reverse order. So you you might think, yeah, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What's wrong with that? Well, actually, that would be wrong. In fact, it prints 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, uh, which is which is not what we would expect. And what's going on is the this item variable is getting reused when it ranges over. And since the defers all happen once this function's exited, by that time, the item has been set to 10. And so then they all are pointing essentially to the same thing. They all then print 10. Uh, the solution is to actually have a little anonymous function. Uh, so in this case, I've just called it handle. And we, we take the item as an argument and then that creates a, a different closure environment in which uh, the data can be stored. And so we can then pass that item as a variable, as an argument, sorry, into the, the little function. So uh, it, I think that's actually quite easy, quite a lot easier to read as well. I think it has that benefit. Um, you can do this in line as well here at number three. Um, and just wrap it in a little anonymous function and pass the argument in immediately. Uh, I find that to be a little bit more weird, but if, if it's a small little case, then fine. Usually they're not small cases, they grow. Um, so I prefer the little handler one. If you like defer gotchas, and peeps, that could be a thing, people could like defer gotchas, there is a great series that goes into uh, lots of these by um, Inak Gumas. So check these out. You can just Google that. You don't have to type in that entire URL, but maybe you do. You, want, you might be into that. I mean, to, if you like defer gotchas, maybe you probably you probably would also be into typing in URLs by hand. Okay, so how does defer actually work? It's really cool. I went poking around. Remember, Go is open source and Go is written in Go. So we can go and see how it works. And I found this type. This is the little defer structure that gets created every time you defer something. And there's some magic in there. This is the, the a lot, some of the standard library, especially the low level stuff looks a lot like C. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't have written the code look, that looks like this, um, but partly that's because I don't really understand the domain as much as the people who write this do. So for example, FD, these variable names, um, PC, SP, they probably mean something in that domain if you understand it. Um, but if, if I was writing this, I'd use names that were very explicit because uh, this looks hard. Uh, I want to draw your attention to one of the fields here. It's quite interesting is this one called link. And notice it's a pointer to the same defer type. And that really uh, tells us, it shows us that Defers are in fact um, a linked list. What's hap what happens is when you when you call defer, the first one's created and the function points to that. And when you then call another one, it's that defer, the new defer points to the old one. And so you end up with a kind of chain of defers in that way. 
which is a very efficient way of doing it. So let's have a look at that visually then. Uh, I'm gonna then, I'm gonna call defer one. So the function is when it exits, it's gonna call one. Then I defer two and the function then points to that two defer and the, it's the two that via the link defer type thing points to the one. So you see, you get this chain. When you then defer three, of course the program's pointing to three and that one is linking down through the chain. And this is how you get, it's a very efficient way of, of creating essentially that chain of, uh, of defers. And also explains in some, uh, in some way why they run in reverse order. It's time for another defer fact of the day. Defer was originally called catch, uh, both chosen by Ken Thompson, and they also considered undo and on return. So just imagine what your code would be. I mean, it, I think undo is a particularly kind of strange, strange one, but cool. Okay, so have you heard of the defer performance problem? Some people I've heard, particularly in the past, less so now, but I have heard people say we don't use defer because we need we want it to perform well. Well, probably it doesn't matter in your case, but maybe it does. And in low latency systems or in code that's really being run, uh, you know, lots and lots of times, nanoseconds do add up. So let's have a look. This is the approximate cost of defers over time. In Go17, you're talking 99 nanoseconds. You know, it's still not insane. It's not too slow, but but check out the progress that's been made uh, until we get to Go113, where we're down to 35 nanoseconds for a defer to, to happen. Now, bear in mind, a normal natural function call is about three nanoseconds. So, you know, yeah, fine. This is why people said, therefore, don't use it. But in practice, that isn't really something you should necessarily worry about. But um, but don't worry, though. Let's What we're going to do now is see if we can optimize defer. So I've got this little function here that's going to get some bread. Lots of people into bread these days. Um, you can see I get some dough. I defer putting the dough back. I get some seeds. I defer putting the seeds back. And then I add the seeds to the dough and I bake it and then I return the bread. And that's essentially um, how you make bread, I think. Um, so could we, could we undefer this in some automatic way? If we had some process that ran before we built the code, could we do something here to kind of avoid the defers at all? And we could, we could get the compiler to open code it. That trick that I talked about at the beginning where you just can call the functions directly, just open code them. We could get the compiler to do that for us. And actually in some cases it will do that. But what about conditionals? Remember the runtime element of uh, defer. Um, and this, this is an example that demonstrates that. If we add this with seeds bool as an optional um, argument, then I'm going to check if that with seeds is true, then we're going to get the seeds and defer putting the seeds back. That means I'm not always going to put the seeds back. So we can't just open code it, everything. We have to be a bit smarter than that. Um, it leaves the question here when we, when we put the seeds back, we don't know if we should or not. We'd have to go and, uh, and maybe copy or do some more work. And I actually built a little prototype of this a few years ago, thinking I was clever that I could solve the defer performance problems. And then uh, as soon as there was a conditional, I was just like, okay, it's too hard. I'm not doing it. Um, I was probably busy as well, but probably not. So in Go114 though, Dan Scales and the team have added open coded defers. So where a defer is called zero or once, so this is, we're talking if conditions, we're not talking about loops, loops are more complicated. Um, the compiler actually will assign a bit for each of those defers in a variable, um, very satisfyingly named defer bits. And uh, it uses bit, bit, you know, bit manipulation to switch on and off bits 
Okay, so if you're not familiar with that, it's worth kind of understanding. We tend not to use it too much, but uh, you know, the, the 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 compiler and the runtime, the Go runtime, it matters. The performance does matter, and they do care about it. So um, uh, they they use bit bit shifting and things, bit manipulation. Uh, the defer statement, it just sets the bit, essentially, and then it saves all the closure information in that defer type. So in the, in the condition with seeds, it'll just set a little bit to say, ah, this whatever the code is, that defer function was hit, so I'm going to set the bit, we should call it. And then at every exit point, the compiler open codes, which is what that process, it open codes each of those deferred calls and calls them only if that bit is set. So it is really a bit like capturing the with seeds bool and checking that at each exit point. That is literally what it's doing. So for example, um, if we're deferring this F1 function and then we have if with seeds, we then are going to defer the, the second function only in that condition, it turns into something like this where we check the, we, we have the defer bits, uh, we set the bit for this particular defer. And then when we are at each of our exit points, we then check to see if that bit is set. And if it is, then we call it. And if it's not, we don't call it. And this gets copied to each of the exit points. However, if this will only work for a specific number of defers. And I found the code that gives us a clue to how many defers this optimization works for. By the way, if it if if it doesn't, if you go over this and, and it doesn't uh, fit this case, it just falls back to the, the previous defer uh, 35 nanosecond one. So you, it'll always still work, uh, but in order for you to get this optimization, there's a maximum number of defers you should use in a function. This is the code that tells it. I mean, this code looks like it was written by when a cat walks across your keyboard, but um, it's 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 not. Uh, and if I zoom in a little, we can see there's a clue here, and the clue is in this uint eight type. Uint eight is an unsigned integer of eight bits. If it was an int eight, one of the bits would be used for the sign, which is to tell you whether it's a positive number or a negative number. But because it's an unsigned integer, it doesn't have the sign bit. And so we have eight bits to play with. So that means we can have eight conditionals. Um, and, and so up to eight defers, it will work. So there's eight bits in that type. That gives us eight defers per function. So if you're lucky enough to only have eight defers in your function, let's see what performance we get out of this. So remember, go 113, 35 nanoseconds, approximately the cost. Calling functions naturally is three nanoseconds. With this optimization, eight, with less than eight defers, it's down to four nanoseconds. So this does away with and finally puts to rest any talk of avoiding defer for performance reasons. And we'll have a look at the final defer fact of the day. Some of the defer design discussion happened on Google Wave, which doesn't exist anymore. And so actually there's a lot of this discussion is now unfortunately lost. So it's very sad fact, that one very sad fact of the day. So should we use defer? Yes, you should use defer. G go and use defer now, please, because they're fast and they make code easier to read. So use defer, especially since Go 114. Ah, thank you very much. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Matt. That was really great. Um, I don't know if we have some, maybe some time for a couple of questions. Let's see if there is anything on the um, on the chat quickly. Um, who designed your slides? I did it myself. Um, then, okay, there is a, okay. This says, can you see that? So do you think it is a problem that it encourages locking a mutex for the scope of a function? It is in when it, oh, it's easier if you read that probably. Yeah, okay, so they're saying that 
if you lock and then unlock, you're locking for the, that entire function. And if you want to be uh, more optimum, you can just lock around the actual bits of data that you're dealing with. So um, I'd, I'd err on the side of readability naturally, but yeah, I mean, if, you, if it mattered that you, you're getting contention because you're locking for too long, then yeah, I've seen it lots of times when the, you go and tighten that defer up. That's a fair point. Um, should probably mention that next time. Cool. Um, I think there are no other questions, but thank you again. That's good because that presentation contained basically everything I know about defer. So there's no question that I'm really <laughs> pleased there's no questions.